excited to welcome Thomas Glass, Dr. Thomas Glass, to talk to us today. Uh, Dr. Glass is an associate professor of epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He has a PhD in medical sociology from Duke University and did postdoctoral training in epidemiology at Yale School of Medicine. Um, he's published over 85 peer-reviewed articles um, and directs the Baltimore Neighborhood Research Consortium. He's also the co-PI of the Baltimore Memory Study and co-directs a training grant in the epidemiology and biostatistics of aging. Um, and so he's going to talk to us today about social context as a risk re regulator. So join me in welcoming Dr. Glass. Thank you very much. Uh, very pleased to be here in a, uh, a nice sized crowd. I'm going to try to talk for about 45, 50 minutes and leave time for questions. Any burning uh, issues you want to um, ask in the, in the middle, please do. Uh, my real, I'm just going to start with my sort of overall objective here, which is to convince you of the potential importance of the concept of a risk regulator and, or something like it, and why I think it could serve the public health mission. And I've been trying to explain this concept since this paper came out, which I'll tell you more about, and I've not succeeded so far. So I'm, I'm using this talk to try a new angle, and uh, I'm going to try to put this in a somewhat larger perspective to explain this concept, where it comes from, and why I think it's needed. So uh, I have four parts to my talk. Part one, why 49, the big question, the big picture question, and why we aren't asking it. Uh, part two, backing ourselves into a causal corner, uh, causal talk as impediment in public health. Part three, risk regulators in the stream of causation metaphor in three dimensions. And part four, analytic approaches to the study of neighborhood factors, some empirical examples. And I really only have time for one. Uh, I'm going to start with this. I, I'm, I'm going to try to lay the big picture context for why I think this kind of idea uh, has potential merit. And I start with this slide. I like to start every talk I do with this slide because I think uh, for some reason uh, the importance of this fundamental fact has, has generally been, been lost. Many of us have seen this kind of number before, but uh, to me this is the big question. This shows uh, average life expectancy in 2007 for the 50 highest ranked uh, countries uh, followed in the U.S. Census Bureau's international database, and we rank 49th. And the question is why? Uh, why is it that our life expectancy is four to five times uh, uh, shorter than uh, uh, other countries. Virtually every developed country and many developing countries uh, have populations that live longer than we do. And the question is not only why, but what is it that we need to do in order to answer the question as to why? What sorts of things do we need to think about and study and emphasize? And are we doing that? Now one possible explanation is the standard sort of causal risk factors uh, may be working against us. And here's a slide showing uh, cigarette uh, consumption. And, if, and, and it turns out that with regard to this and many of the other standard sort of health jeopardizing risk factors, the U.S. actually does quite well. So this is clearly not an explanation for why 49. Uh, it may, one could argue we don't get enough health care, but of course that argument borders on the absurd since we are the world's big spender. In fact, the United, spent, the United States spends more in total dollars on health care than the rest of the developed world combined. We are way out in front and headed for over 19 percent of GDP by uh, the year 2017. This, this is not an isolated uh, or temporary uh, trend in spending. We just getting, keep getting more medicine, more imaging, more surgeries, more diagnostic procedures, and yet we continue to be next to the last among top 50 countries in average life expectancy. And of course, I could have shown you many different um, indicators other than just average life expectancy. Now, if you look at, uh, I love this slide, if you look at the, the relationship between average life expectancy and spending per capita on healthcare, you see First of all, that we are way, way out relative to anyone else. 
And if you fit a regression line, it turns out there is bang for your buck. If you spend more per capita on health care, you do see a generalized improvement in health care. But our country ranks uh, way out in front on expenditure, but our performance is down here in the range of countries that are spending $1,000 a person. We're getting the same output or the same performance from countries like Ecuador, South Korea, Slovenia, Her Herzegovina, that are spending uh, uh, vastly uh, fewer dollars on health care. So it's clearly not absence of health care. If you look at an even bigger picture um, about where the big gains in life expectancy have come over the last hundred years, it's quite clear that ma the majority of the uh, increases in life expenditure uh, uh, occurred in the early part of the 20th century as a result of fundamental uh, improvements in public health. And where sort of medicine and clinical care start to become more um, efficacious, uh, not so clear what the role there is. So it seems to me one of the things we ought to be focusing on more are issues related to basic fundamental public health. Now that unfortunately is not what we do, as particularly as reflected in the NIH's uh, own uh, budget priorities. Here we see four fiscal years. And if you look at the, the areas that are way out in front, we are convinced that more biotechnology, clinical research, genetics, neuroscience, and brain disorder, or what I would call high-tech medicine, is clearly the thing we need to do. And that's where our priorities have been. And if you look for basic public health, it's either kind of at the bottom or interspersed in other places. And one thing you don't see is the National Institute of why we're 49th and what it is it about America that is killing people. That institute doesn't exist. The nature of the, in fact, it's very difficult even to find pockets of really, truly comparative research. People aren't asking, what is going on in Japan and Andorra and, uh, and other countries where people live longer? What is it about those places that are associated with increased life expectancy? And this, I think, is a kind of misplaced uh, um, set of priorities. And the question is why, um, even though our keys are somewhere else. Let me turn briefly to obesity. I love obesity. I've done a lot of work on obesity. Um, obesity is a, is a great problem is to study from the standpoint of social factors because here's a slide um, by an anthropologist that shows that every single rate of obesity exists somewhere. From uh, great old Nauru at uh, nearly 80%, all the way down to countries that are near zero. Every possible rate of obesity exists somewhere. And that ought to be enough to tell us that obesity is about environments. It's about places. It's about the characteristics of the places where people live. Now, we see the same pattern in the United States where over 20 years after fairly steady, uh, um, uh, fairly stable rates of obesity, something happened in 1980 that caused the doubling of obesity rates. The rates doubled in many other countries too, but because they started at a much lower level, their obesity rates uh, in general among most OECD countries are less than half of what our, ours are. But we don't really have much research going on about why the Japanese are different than us. Very little work comparatively has gone on to try to answer questions about what happens when uh, 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 across different countries. And so while we all uh, wring, our, wring our hands and say, well, we don't know how to treat obesity other than bariatric surgery, Actually, the best treatment for obesity for Americans would be to send Americans who are fat to any other country. <laughs> now, that ought to be a clue. That ought to be a clue. That ought to be a research agenda. And uh, that says, uh, in the proposed plan for obesity research 2011, priorities include animal models, complex signaling pathways in the brain, and between other organs. Obesity-related gene variants, we've been looking for them. We got 265 obesity-related gene variants. 
Half of them show up in some studies and then they disappear in others. But we've still not found the obesity gene. The belief that we will is a hard, it seems to be a myth that will not die. Uh, and of course now the new thing, epigenetics. Now is there anything on this list that has general applicability to, to the question of how to solve the puzzle of this picture or this one? Is it possible that these magnificently dramatic patterns of obesity prevalence could be uh, explained because we have different gene variants? That seems highly unlikely to me. And of course, no one is interested in exactly what the heck is going on in Japan or the Netherlands or Spain or France or any other country where obesity rates are much lower than we are. Now, uh, I want to end this part of the talk by uh, reminding you of some years ago, which I call the Rose Insight, which is to say, well, really, in, under, in order to understand problems of population rates of disease, we need to ask different questions than understanding individual level risk for disease. This is one of his central theses. And so here's an example of that. We have uh, homicide rates on the uh, vertical axis in Chicago, Canada, and England and Wales. Now, if you only looked at individual level characteristics of perpetrators, and here I'm just looking at age of perpetrator, you would see that in the three places, the distribution of age of perpetrators is identical. It's identical. Individual level, what, what, did, what predicts what an individual, whether an individual will become a perpetrator or not, is consistent and similar across the, all three places. However, knowing age of perpetrator tells you absolutely nothing about the 300 pound elephant here, which is that look at the magnitude of difference in the rates from zero to 900 per 100,000 population versus in Canada, 0 to 60, uh, 0 to 30. Uh, extraordinary differences in the underlying rates at a population level. In order to understand rates at a population level, we need to appeal to characteristics of places to understand place level differences in rates. And yet somehow that has become increasingly difficult to do within the NIH environment. And I'm trying to understand why it is that we continue to have a myopic focus on individual level variables that may tell us a lot about individual risk, but tell us nothing about why obesity rates, for example, or homicide rates are wildly different in different places. And here's a potential explanation or partial one. And for this, I have to do a very quick uh, and, and dirty uh, review of philosophy. And if there are any philosophers here, I'm going to apologize because this is uh, extraordinarily, uh, going to be extraordinarily uh, simplistic and brief. But I want to remind you that within um, the great canon of philosophical discussion on the subject of cause, there are at least two main branches of the tree. One comes from uh, uh, David Hume, uh, who, who spent a lot of time thinking about causation and argued that in order to determine causation, he said we have to have demonstrated what he called a necessary connection. And if you read what he says about this, it becomes quite clear that, that in Hume's point of view, he's not sure that causal relationships actually even exist in nature, but if they do, it's unlikely we're ever going to know them for reasons having to do with the limits of our own capacity to understand, imagine, and do science. So for Hume, the idea of, uh, of, of talking about causes is an unnecessary adventure in metaphysical mysticism. Even pretending that we can identify causes is not only a, a bad idea, but a potentially dangerous and misleading one. Now, if you think that the idea of Hume is dead, think, consider Carl Pearson, who we all have heard of because of the Pearson correlation coefficient. One, what many of us don't know is that Pearson was famous for saying, once you know the correlation between two things, you know everything you need to know and everything there is to know. He was of the Humean perspective, which called into question the very notion that we could separate association from causation. He would have regarded that as an unnecessary adventure in metaphysical mysticism. Then along comes John Stuart Mill, 
father, if you might say, of logical positivism, who uh, had a nervous breakdown at age 20. That's never neither here nor there. Uh, uh, Mill argued instead that, oh, no, the world is governed by a set of universal laws waiting to be discovered. The universe works in a way where causes uh, exist and can be discerned if we follow the rules of science. This was the age of enlightenment, and um, John Stuart Mill led the way towards the ideas that have given rise to the Rubin model, the potential outcomes model, and most of our thinking about causation temp uh, contemporaneously. Um, however, uh, I would finally remind you as a historical note that when modern epidemiology first emerged, uh, or, or the first textbook uh, by uh, McMahon and Pugh, uh, there's very little discussion of cause. In fact, even in the first Surgeon General's report of 1964, the word cause does not appear using, in the same language that we see in later versions of the Surgeon General's report. Some skepticism. This was rather Humean perspective that they took on the idea of cause at first. Now this has all changed in the last 30 years and what we now have as characterized by my good friend Miguel Hernan at Harvard is a definition of causal effect. This is the paper that sort of laid out, well one of the papers that sort of laid out what, what has come to be a consensus about what we mean when we say cause. And basically um, I'll run this through this very quickly. Uh, Miguel's uh, perspective or the perspective of, of the potential outcomes framework is that a causal effect can be defined as a comparison of potential outcomes. Present if average outcome had everyone been exposed does not equal average outcome had no one been exposed. And so we have to do this sort of mental um, calculus or this mental thought experiment in order to imagine a causal effect where we imagine one possible world where no one is exposed and he's from which we gather a the probability of disease given unexposure and we have to imagine another, another world which is identical to the first world including the fact that it has the same exact people in it only uh, everyone has been exposed and the true causal effect then becomes uh, the difference in the disease rates in those two possible worlds. Now the problem obviously is we, we only get to see one world uh, and the other world remains counterfactual. It's just an imagined world. This is the kind of thing that would make Hume uh, roll over in his grave. Aha, see what I mean? Uh, mystic, uh, metaphysical mysticism in action. So to approximate this counterfactual world, we need a control group, which in a random style is fairly straightforward. And in an observational study, we approximate this counterfactual condition by controlling on covariates. Now this has primed our thinking about what it is that can and cannot be classified as a cause. And one of the things that this means is that there are a whole range of things things that make Japan and Andorra different than the United States that are now off the radar screen as potential causes. They do not qualify because they do not fit the model. They do not fit the language of our causal speak. And one of those characteristics are attributes of places. Why? Well, number one, experiments are impossible to, uh, or unethical and even difficult to imagine. Two, because uh, the effects associated with places are non-specific, so living in a really poor place causes every possible bad outcome, but not with any great degree of specificity, and we all remember the canon of uh, specificity from the Hill criteria. Uh, Non-random assignment to context makes exchangeable comparison groups impossible. Uh, risk factors are chained together, they're not separable. Clinical trials are beautiful because we can give it a drug or a placebo and have that be completely independent of whatever other risk uh, factors may be existing in the environment. But to talk about places, a place is a bundle of chained together risk factors that are not separable. Um, in addition, the standard risk factors that we might want to uh, uh, study, once we've controlled for confounders, we, it leads to over-adjustment. 
uh, because these things are on the causal pathway in between where you live and health outcomes. Extreme stratification leads to violation of positivity assumption, meaning that if you study really bad neighborhoods, there may be no uh, there may be no wealthy people or no white people living there, in which case adjusting for race causes a gross violation in, um, in uh, positivity assumptions. The relationships between places and health may be complex and nonlinear, uh, ex endogenous or what's been called dependent happenings. Now, this has led my good friend uh, Mike Oakes to say in a paper called The Misestimation of Neighborhood Effects, he says, we show that identifying useful independent neighborhood effect parameters as currently conceptualized is impossible. Therefore, neighborhoods, countries, other place level characteristics are out the window as causes. And I've ar I'm essentially arguing that um, this idea of having a causal framework, a causal theory that does not permit a whole range of variables that may be of incredible importance at explaining differences in disease rates has sort of boxed us into a corner and made it very difficult um, to study, uh, evaluate, and intervene on factors that aren't somehow, uh, don't qualify as causes. Okay, so how have we tried to deal with this? Obviously, social epidemiologists have got to fight against this because this, these are the kind of things that we, these are our stock and trade. Um, so there have been at least three approaches to dealing with this issue. One is uh, Lincoln Phelan's fundamental causes framework that says, no, not only are these causes, but they're fundamental. And I'm going to say they're fundamental until I'm blue in the face. I'm not sure anyone's been listening. Uh, secondly, the Ecosocial Epidemiology School by Krieger and Susser, and that has gained some traction, uh, but has not yet, um, I think, convinced the field. Um, the third approach has been uh, popularized by Jay Kaufman and people like that saying, well, let's study only social phenomenon that can be subject to treatment assignment. And other, other than that, we're going to have to forget about the rest. Now, this has led to what's been called the epi wars, arguments about whether social factors belong in epidemiology. And some of the titles have been social epidemiology, no way. To, to which Kaufman says, <laughs> way, which gives you a sense of just about how, uh, what the level of uh, maturity has been in this debate, and sometimes it is that way. Uh, the failure of academic epidemiology, witness for the prosecution, and then our conscientious objection to the epi wars. So I don't think that this uh, debate has been resolved in any satisfactory way. And uh, we still don't have a clear uh, idea of what to call variables that may matter but may not qualify as causes. And that is the context in which I tried to, uh, or my colleague and I tried to uh, introduce some new language and some new thinking into this problem in this paper where we attempted to modify and extend the stream of causation metaphor, uh, propose the risk regulator concept, address some of these causal inference problems and, uh, and used obesity as an example. Now to just sort of quickly summarize what I mean by this, our, our thought was, you know, we basically have an individual actor at the sort of behavioral level whose health behaviors we want to explain. Eating, sex, taking drugs, uh, uh, working, exercising, all of the real smoking, all of the real serious public health issues come down to, boil down to this sort of behavioral nexus, what it is people do in particular contexts. And below that we have a series of sort of biological um, s substrate that is uh, uh, basically organized around a series of centralized regulatory systems. Um, and way up here above, we have these sort of macro level phenomenon like land use, culture, economics, and markets, which are very remote. Most people don't really know about them. People don't understand labor markets, but they influence them in some way. And so our argument was to say, let's focus on and develop some new language to understand what is in the middle. How is it that the effect of e economics and labor markets gets down 
to the behavioral nexus and into the body and ultimately affects these regulatory systems. What is the, what is the machinery that is associated with that um, transmission uh, uh, of, of forces? And the idea of the risk regulator was an attempt to get at that. These are meso or middle level factors that are visible and present in the lives of people. They are things that are within the conscious purview of individual actors and um, which are essentially the conduits or channels through which upper level macro system uh, factors get down to the behavioral level and influence behavioral by behavior by, by creating opportunities and constraints for particular kinds of behaviors. Um, and furthermore, also have uh, direct linkages um, uh, through both material exposures and non-material exposures into these, uh, this biological substrate, uh, potentially turning genes on and off, uh, upregulating and downregulating uh, metabolic processes and cardiovascular systems, etc. And this is sort of the big picture view of what we were uh, trying to get at uh, here. At a simpler level, the idea of a risk regulator was to say, you want to argue about what's a cause? Okay, fine. These are not causes. But what they are, we're going to try to use a kind of engineering language to talk about risk regulators as valves or levers that operate as system control parameters, operating above the heads of individuals and modifying the probability of certain behavioral states within given contexts in a way that would help us understand uh, aggregate level population patterns of behavior and health outcomes. Now some Im implications of this idea are number one, uh, it's, a, it's a call to shift from the idea of health behaviors to health actions where we bring agency back in and consider uh, human beings as conscious uh, strategizers rather than simply uh, behavioral billiard balls responding in a stimulus response kind of way. Um, it requires a shift from a focus on uh, individual characteristics and uh, personality traits to states that arise in particular circumstances and contexts. Uh, a shift from static self-report data to the need for real-time objective uh, data uh, across different action uh, platforms. And a shift from highly deterministic uh, models uh, conceived of in a sort of very Mills-like Newtonian billiard balls kind of uh, uh, vision of the world to a dynamic systems modeling approach. And from a shift to single independent risk factors to risk regimes. And I'll say one thing about what I mean by that now. So um, what we normally do when we, uh, when we study a, a problem related to some health behavior like gun violence, some risk factor like a gunshot wound and disease, <clears throat> is we focus narrowly on a series of factors that are fairly downstream or to use this topographical three-dimensional image downhill uh, from uh, the factors that might uh, differentiate different places. And when we focus only on those things, um, we, we tend to uh, have a view of, of the importance of these factors that is exaggerated uh, in, uh, from the standpoint of more population-based thinking. What we really need to do is consider um, uh, a more comprehensive and global perspective to talk about uh, a concept like risk regime, which sees uh, health behaviors, individual risk factors, and attributes within the larger context uh, of place level characteristics that may be uphill and which through the force of gravity may have strong influences on the distribution of these behaviors and risk factors. So we must go beyond <clears throat> the question of starting out with the idea of some people use guns and some people don't and ask the question, what might be going on further uphill that determines how it is that the guns are awash in some places and scarce in others? Places where violence is normalized in some contexts and very counter-normative in others. And 
If we do that, uh, or in the absence of doing that, we get this sort of exaggerated uh, sense of the role of these things. But if we were to um, examine a more comprehensive view of these factors, uh, we would sort of develop this idea, uh, what I call an uh, etiologic inertia, whereas we're not only just focusing on the sort of tip of the, of the arrow here, which are the things, you know, the bullet itself is ultimately the thing we'd all agree is the cause of death in handgun violence. But knowing what the cause is tells us very little about <clears throat> how the rates of a gun death may vary across places. In order to do that, we need to travel further up this, this sort of arrow of, of etiologic inertia and understand factors uphill that give rise to different distributions of the behaviors and different probability uh, that an individual will be, will be shot. And this, this is terribly important in the context of what it is we're going to intervene on. For example, if we said, oh, well, the cause and we can show this using counterfactual logic and a clinical trial if we dare to do one. The cause of death in a handgun is uh, you know, the penetration of the human body and subsequent uh, uh, by a metallic projectile sub uh, subsequent to uh, exsanguination. Everybody can agree with that, that that is the cause, but knowing the cause doesn't tell us anything about what is the best approach to intervention. Because if we focused on this as the cause, what would we do? We'd put Kevlar vests on everyone. And that's hardly the appropriate thing to do. Now, just because we, we have trouble fitting this into, shoehorning this into our idea of cause, doesn't mean that trying to change something up here so that it cascades and produces a lower probability of things going on down here doesn't mean that we ought to focus on our interventions down here just because we can say unambiguously that that's the cause. And that's the sort of inner logic of the, um, <coughs> of the uh, argument I'm trying to make. So now part four, <coughs> analytic approaches. There are, in fact, um, existing analytic approaches that I think can be um, utilized to, to, to study uh, neighborhood characteristics in, uh, in uh, uh, the, the context of this idea of a risk regulator, and I'll show you three examples. One is we can talk about a risk regulator as something that uh, is a promoter or preventer, uh, preventer of some important causal risk factor. Here's the, the uh, for example, um, uh, uh, environmental stress and uh, high blood pressure might be an example. A second example would be a, a risk regulator as a magnifier or attenuator of some other risk factor disease association. And a third possibility is a risk regulator that is a secondary promoter or preventer involved in a larger uh, chain of uh, risk factor relationships. And uh, very briefly, an example of, of the first kind that we've done is to show that uh, neighborhood psychosocial hazards, which is uh, a measure of how dangerous and scary and stress evoking a neighborhood might be, we found to be associated with an increased risk of obesity in older adults, adjusting for a bunch of standard individual behavioral risk factors. And this comports nicely with animal models showing that stressed animals tend to uh, consume more calories. Uh, the second, uh, the uh, second example, that of a risk magnifier, we uh, did a study showing that the same variable neighborhood psychosocial, living in a dangerous and scary neighborhood, actually upregulates or magnifies the effect of bone lead on cognition. So that if you live in a high stress neighborhood, the effect of lead on your brain is exacerbated. So, uh, and these are fairly straightforward um, kinds of analyses. You recognize this as an effect modification hypothesis. Uh, this stuff is relatively straightforward. Now, I'm going to give you a third example here in the next five minutes that uh, I think is a little bit more novel uh, and interesting. Uh, uh, and I'll set it up by saying that neighborhood risk regimes may influence injection use behavior. <coughs> injection drug users are highly mobile. Selection into neighborhoods may be associated with health. Uh, 
um, and that uh, there is this problem of time varying confounders affected by uh, prior exposure, which I'll uh, uh, explain in a little bit more in a second. Uh, regular old uh, regression model adjustment leads to a collider stratification bias and the underestimate of the effect of the neighborhood variable. And one possible better strategy, uh, which is good for this secondary risk promoter idea, is the use of inverse probability weighting and marginal structural models. So here's the kind of problem we have. We have people who are moving from neighborhood to neighborhood, injection drug users. And it may be that there are factors in their, uh, their covariates that determine where they live. But more than that, there are also, there's also the possibility that some of these intermediate risk variables are themselves determined by what neighborhood you're in. And, that, and therefore, they are on the causal pathway between exposure and the outcome. If we adjust for all these things as if they're confounders, then we make the effect go away and we're essentially uh, overestimating. And this is the central problem that plagues most neighborhood research. As you look at a crude association between neighborhood and some outcome, and it's really strong. You adjust for a bunch of individual level covariates and the neighborhood effect goes away. And my argument is that it's, it's primarily because we're adjusting for things that are actually on the causal pathway and it's a case of time varying uh, confounding affected by a prior exposure. And that leads to a uh, bias toward the null. So we tested this using the uh, ALIVE cohort, AIDS linked to intravenous uh, experience. Uh, 3,000 uh, injection drug users recruited in 88 and followed twice a year. We geocoded 41,000 visits, very high retention rate, um, and analyzed uh, these visits to understand and model the uh, drug cessation uh, behavior as a function of a primary exposure of interest, which in this case was neighborhood poverty. Now we did this analysis first in a crude way, and there is in fact a strong crude association where less neighborhood poverty uh, is associated with, a, a, uh, a, uh, in a dose response way, a higher probability of injection drug use um, cessation. When we go to the standard regression adjustment, however, um, the effect is severely attenuated and essentially is no longer significantly different than zero. Um, and therefore, adjust for all the intermediate uh, covariates and the effect goes away. Using the inverse probability of weighting approach, um, which has the advantage of being able to adjust not only for baseline covariates, but takes account of this um, time varying uh, confounding problem, uh, uh, we, we recover a, a significant association where less poverty means more, uh, a higher probability of injection uh, drug cessation. So another example. Now, um, there are lots of other uh, less well known and less well developed approaches that I think could be used to understand and study the idea uh, of risk regulators. Uh, community level experiments, uh, I just showed you marginal structural models, instrumental variables and natural experiments. But there are some um, additional uh, approaches on the horizon, uh, including s sort of super multi level models where you really have country level differences. Uh, and, and multiple sub-nested systems within that. Uh, dynamic systems modeling, agent-based modeling, and be biobehavioral signal processing where you're gathering real-time uh, data on individuals as they move through different contexts. So these are some of the things that I think uh, are in the future going to help us uh, better to uh, get our hands around this kind of idea. So the take-home message for my talk today the U.S. is a super efficient disease generating machine and we are uh, less focused on explaining and understanding why that is than I think we ought to be. One of the reasons I think that it's been difficult to frame the question in a way that might uh, lead to better, um, more progress in public health is that we have adopted and come to some rocky consensus about uh, our definition of cause that makes it very difficult to justify uh, uh, studying factors that uh, might not be causes but might be ideal targets for intervention.
and might be the important features that allow us to uh, uh, intervene in ways that would make a difference at a population level. So instead of asking what are the causes of obesity, we ought to instead be thinking about what are the upstream risk regulators that we can change that might have a minuscule or small effect on individual risk, but would shift entire population distributions. And I see some of you recognize that this once again is the language of Jeffrey Rose. And this is an idea that we've, that's been around a long time. For some reason, it's never quite gotten traction. But the problem of obesity is not going to be solved through bariatric surgery um, or identifying an obesity gene. At least in my, that's what I would argue. And finally, this idea of risk chaining, that risk regimes form um, uh, uh, an entire sort of suite or portfolio or linked uh, together set of risk factors that here at the level of place and the idea of sort of partialing them out and looking at them independently, um, I think, is, 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 is a fundamental uh, methodological and causal error. Uh, lots of colleagues have helped me develop this work, including people who've worked on the Baltimore Memory Study. Uh, I am very thankful to uh, uh, a number of uh, graduate students I've worked with, including Arjit Nandi, um, who uh, I understand just left Harvard. He was a Robert Wood Johnson scholar there, and he was the first author on that uh, paper that we did uh, looking at injection drug use. So thank you very much, and I would love to uh, entertain any questions you might have in the last five minutes or seven minutes that we have. Uh, I saw your hand first. You're second. How about that? Uh, there's nobody in my field who's not very familiar with, with the three examples of behavioral science, social epidemiology that's appeared in the science, the journal Science. We, we all know them. <laughs> We're very proud of them. I'm very proud of that group for doing that. Yeah. So uh, the question would be... Uh, I think... Um, their work fits very nicely into um, uh, the schema that um, I have tried to put forward in the sense that they are placing uh, the emphasis on um, a characteristic of places rather than the characteristics of the individuals there. Now, I should say that the Chicago Project on Human Development is the superconducting super collider of social science studies. And they have the resources and capacity to measure things like collective efficacy at a community level uh, that far exceeds what most of us are able to do, which is uh, terrific and, and, uh, and quite a brave uh, study uh, to have uh, uh, pulled off. But the emphasis on, uh, on collective efficacy as a uh, variable that exists at a higher level of, uh, of, of organization and may itself have very uh, weak and small and negligible effect on the, on the risk of any one person being subject to violence, but yet is a very potent and robust predictor of violence rates shows a really important thing, which is that if you want to know where to intervene, why consider intervening at the level of individual risk factors for violence when uh, the intervention target of uh, identifying uh, the characteristics that lead to collective efficacy makes a lot more sense from a bang for the buck point of view. So I think their, their study would be one of my top you know, five all-time studies uh, in line with the thinking I'm trying to propose. Yes. 
Okay, so how does in, the question is how does inequality fit into this framework? Well, I have three comments about that. One is, we, you know, the, the old psycho, psychology experiment, faces, vases, faces, vases, you look at, you can't see both. You say, when people say inequality, um, there's this sort of gestalt shift that goes back and forth, where on the one hand, people can think of inequality as a characteristic of places vis-a-vis -vis the Gini index. Inequality could be uh, a statement about the distribution of rewards and opportunities at place level. Or inequality could mean individual level income. And often what happens in, in, in public health is that we make, we somehow instinctively make the shift when we, somebody says inequality and everybody makes the faces to face shift and, and then immediately starts talking about individual income. Or you want to study in, uh, pop, population level inequality, but you want to put in individual level income as a confounder. And poof, away goes the effect of inequality. So that's a cautionary note about the importance of inequality. Second of all, I mean, the study of inequality um, goes back hundreds of years and has been one of the most consistent uh, uh, and clear um, uh, uh, topics of conversation in public health uh, 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 going back to the very beginnings of the sanitation movement, for example. Um, in my view, it is important to begin to unpack inequality and understand more precisely uh, what exactly it is about conditions of inequality that lead to g differences in behavior and health outcomes. The idea of embodiment is an attractive idea. However, I'm always a little bit suspicious about our desire to, uh, to, to zoom in and focus on what's going on under the skin. And I agree that that's a problem. And I agree that epigenetics offers an opportunity to link what's going outside to what's going on inside, and it's very exciting. But, the, but if, if you look at the, if you take the whole pie of what we think about and worry about, and what fraction of it is focused on what's going on inside the skin, particularly inside the brain under the skull, relative to what's going on outside of the skin that might give rise to these things, I think we are so far out of balance that I'm actually more in favor of out of embodiment. I am more interested in further articulating the conditions from the skin out and how the uh, formation of social structure gives rise. One quick example of that, the concept of stress. Everybody throws around the idea of stress. Stress, stress, stress. Everybody studies stress. Where does stress come from? Where does stress, from where does stress emanate? We do this face is vase thing and somehow stress somehow becomes like a personality quirk or a, uh, some sort of random uh, uh, thing that pops up in the context of our daily lives. But if stress is to have any meaning, stress has to be uh, a, a physiologic reaction to some environmental phenomenon. Now what is that environmental phenomenon? Is it a stressor? Well, the word stressor I have a lot of problems with. Happiness is a biological state. The things that make me happy, I don't call them happiers. The idea of a stressor hides from us something. It hides something. Uh, I prefer the language of psychosocial hazard. That is the thing in the environment that evokes in all mammals a an adaptive challenge that is either a positive or a negative stress response. And I want more focus on what it is outside, what it is that's going on in neighborhoods that evokes stress. Where right now we tend to regard stress as exogenous. It pops out of nowhere, or it's a characteristic of individuals. There's very, very little work to try to understand where stress comes from, from where it emanates. Uh, I forget whose hand was next. OK. Yeah. That you can measure, I think, biobehavioral factors and people are moving from time and place. So if I could play devil's advocate, you know, why should we care? Um, given that uh, you're also saying the focus should kind of be on the outside, to just to understand the mechanism? Um, no, if I want to understand um, 
if I understand um, the effect of um, place on blood pressure, and I get a cohort of people, and I do the same thing we've been doing for 30 years, which is I, get a co I do a cohort study, and uh, once a year I sit someone in a chair and I measure their blood pressure three times. And then I do it again the next year. And I look for the effect of places based on where they say they live on the blood pressure readings I get there, and then a year later, and a year later, I will have learned nothing. Because all I'm getting is some grand super mean average. What I'm missing is how someone's blood pressure changes when they're in the car in traffic, when they're standing in front of a group at NIH trying to convince them of something. Uh, if we take the idea of contextualism seriously, we've got to measure the dynamic characteristics of human functioning and behavior dynamically in real time so we can match people's behavioral and physiologic states to the context in which they are in now. This is what I mean by moving from traits to states. So right now what we do is we measure psychological things like coping or social networks or things like this statically once a year in time. And then we learn nothing because it is only in the dynamicity of these phenomena changing context to context that the patterns uh, that, that I think are really there emerge. And we're simply stuck on paper and pencil things to measure things like social support and social networks and efficacy and all these other things, even though we know that they are um, uh, themselves subject to uh, horrendous measurement error. We can't find a new way to do it, and I think a new way is emerging, and it's largely emerging uh, because of these. And if you just think for a minute about what this could do to measurement in behavioral and social science, because it's location, it's communication, it's social interaction in real time, and, and, and you can put it on a map and identify how and, and study how uh, being in one kind of place affects behavior versus uh, being in another kind of place. You, you don't look convinced. Yeah, so when we, we put, take somebody into a clinic and we, take them and, we, and, and we ask them a survey, we're essentially decontextualizing them. We're saying, on average, all other things being equal. And by the way, let me remove you from any context for the purposes of filling out this survey. Because I want to wash all that away. I mean, that's the great legacy, the great legacy of Lazarusfeld and the survey revolution was that <coughs> it, it, it gave us a, a tool we never had before. But that tool has uh, now outlived its usefulness. And in, in the, I, while there are some advantages to getting responses to survey and questionnaires, they're completely decontextualized. Um, at the same time, it completely impoverishes our ability to understand the role of context. Because it's only by real-time data collection of people in context while they're living in context, which was not even imaginable to Lazarusfeld, that, um, the, that we can really elucidate how being in one kind of neighborhood or place affects you physiologically or behaviorally compared to another. I mean, the behavioral economists have started to figure this out. Like they discovered, somehow economists have discovered that human beings are social and not always rational in all those places. Oh, wow, congratulations. Nobel Prize for that. Uh, but it turns out economists find out that you take a, a, a teenager and you put them in a lab and ask them questions about their health behaviors, their smoking, et cetera, et cetera, and they'll give you one set of answers that will be right. You take them in a bar, fill them with drinks in a dance club where the music is pounding, and they've done this experiment, and they, you put them in what's called a hot state, and their answers are completely different. Their physiology is different. Their behaviors are different in ways that they would never have been able to predict, ex explain, uh, even to themselves, had you asked them in a cold state. So this idea of contextually determined physiology and behavior is only, only studyable if we're actually uh, um, 
putting sensors on people and observing them as they move through context. That's the argument I would make. Did you have a question? Well, of course, every every school is nothing but a tree that's standing in some forest. And if we ignore the forest, um, it's and we see that that some schools do poorly and not others, we may misattribute the influence. Um, uh, now, because we can sort of randomize schools, we can imagine randomizing schools. That becomes the thing we're going to look at to, to identify the causal effect of schools. In the meantime, we're going to ignore the fact that schools are lodged within communities. And the pathologies that walk through the door of every school are the pathologies that have their origins in communities, some of which are very pathological. So intervening at the level of schools is like focusing on the tip of the arrow and forgetting the causal forces that emanate further uphill. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. Now, I, uh, the question is, can I think of a way to falsify? I, I apologize for what I'm about to say, but I do not um, uh, worship at the altar of Karl Popper. And I actually think that this is part of what I mean. Uh, the doctrine of falsification is, uh, is I think, uh, part of the reason we study the wrong things and make little progress. Uh, people are always, at, I'm at Hopkins in epidemiology, people are always reminding me that the clinical trial, which is you know standard Popperian falsifiable science, is the king of evidence. And I always ask people, which do you believe more about the, whether the polio vaccine worked? The fact that the clinical trials done on the polio vaccine worked or the fact that polio went away in the population. Which do you believe constitutes a higher standard of evidence? So um, uh, if you take a dynamic, if you talk to engineers or meteorologists or people who think post uh, Popper and post Newton about nature, if you talk to evolutionary scientists and you throw this sort of falsification idea in front of them, they say, uh, you don't get it. Nature doesn't work that way. Uh, and the, the doctrine of falsification um, uh, uh, is, uh, is as much of an impediment as anything. Now, that is not an easy pill. Because I, I you know, if, if if I want to, if I'm sick and have a disease and want to know whether drug A works better than drug B, um, I want Karl Popper on my side. <laughs> Absolutely. The question is, um, are all questions uh, that are relevant to us in public health um, best suited to that model of science? To that model of science. And uh, so far, we have been trying to squeeze every uh, uh, round peg into, every, into that particular square hole. 
And uh, I envision a day in which there are, there's a pluralism of epistemologies uh, of which uh, kind of Popperian falsification and, and a hypothesis t and a whole pi hypothesis testing machinery that, that, um, that follows it. Uh, is, is just one of a multiple set of uh, epistemological tools. Now, we aren't, we aren't there yet, but the barbarians are at the gates. You know, if you tried to talk about uh, falsifiable, uh, discrete hypotheses and uh, linear deterministic models to a meteorologist trying to predict the weather, uh, you would find that they're, they're in a different world as our engineers. And I've been trying to learn a lot from engineers about the way they think about these things. Probably not a satisfactory answer, but that's what I got right now. Thanks. Thank you.